All right, okay. so we can start. So recording in progress, guys. So welcome everybody. I'm Audio, and this is the opening class of a book a month, right? So um, this uh, course of ours, this actually school of ours, um, in which we teach both um, literature and practice English, both at the same time, right? So we have um, a double objective. here. Uh, me and Anna are the teachers of a book a month, and today we'll be sharing with you um, how our, our ideas about uh, language learning, our ideas about literature, how we work at a book a month, and we'll share with you a few tips on how to read uh, in English or in any foreign language, actually. I don't know if you guys can speak other languages, but, but you know, we, we often try to learn new things and, and many of the tips we'll share with you today are transferable. You can use them in, in other scenarios as well. Okay, so let me share my screen with you guys. So we can start our introduction uh, class uh, in which we will learn what, how and why we read, right? So here in, in a book a month. Um, so we are the teachers here. Me, I'm Audio, Audio Lustosa Guedes is my full name. Uh, and the, the other teacher, and actually the founder of, of the school is Ana Carolina Torquato, right? So Ana, would you like to introduce yourself first? All right, people. So for you, uh, I, I think from the ones who are here today, uh, I think only Thais I haven't met before, right? Uh, Michelle, uh, we have met in other uh, Book of Month classes as well. So nice to meet you all. Uh, Chris as well, we have met in, in the previous open class, right? And um, nice to meet you all, Amana. Uh, I'm the founder and teacher of Book of Month. Uh, this year, I'm actually on my sabbatical leave, mostly because I'm doing my postdoc um you're based in sao paulo but it's a project that is uh, in in joint conjunction with the university of cologne and um also i have done my phd in comparative literature by the university of uh, the federal university of paraná with a short um exchange program break in uh, germany at the university of potsdam and I have done a very interesting master's degree, which is the same kind of master's that Audio has done, um, which is multi-institutional, right? So we have had the opportunity to study in three different universities, right? And also we do have like three separate diplomas. Um, so I studied in the University of Sheffield in England, uh, in Santiago de Compostela, in Spain, and in the, university, the Nova University of Lisbon, in Portugal, right? So um, in both of these, uh, my degrees, I studied comparative literature, but also uh, with emphasis to uh, literatures in English and Brazilian literature. Uh, my turn. So I'm also a PhD in literature. Um, I've graduated in the University of Padua uh, in Italy. And I've studied comparative literature over there as well. And I also took my master's in literature and in Italy, once again, in the University of Bologna with uh, two exchange periods, one in France, in Strasbourg, and another one in Greece, in Thessaloniki, which is the second biggest city in Greece. After Athens, then, then you have Thessaloniki. And I'm, I'm also the, the creator and the host of a podcast, uh, Literatura Viral, it is in Portuguese, it's not in English, uh, in which I discuss uh, my PhD subject, actually, sorry, my, my PhD subject, which is uh, what we call the medical humanities. So I discuss how literature and art are connected with diseases, diseases, epidemics, and, and medicine in general. So it's a very funny, weird connection. If you guys want to check it out, you can find it in for free online, okay? And there have been many episodes in which I discussed authors, which have also been discussed in a book a month, uh, such as Edgar Allan Poe, which we would, who will be reading uh, this semester, or Mary Shelley, or H.G. Uh, Wells, that, that is, there was part of um, 
previous reading lists or uh, fill in off as well here in Morocco. So um, both projects work a little bit side by side. Okay. And we wanted to share a, a few fun facts with you. Uh, usually we play a game, uh, but, but today, since we're mixing all, all the, the levels, we, we decided to just uh, uh, create this post-it. So, so you could uh, get a little sense of, of our lives beyond academia, right? So I have lived for three years in Singapore. Uh, when, after, after college, so I graduated in Brazil. Uh, and then I moved to Singapore and worked there for three years in a multinational company and I had to use like a tie and everything. So uh, it was nothing connected with literature or, or university at all. So it was a very nice experience. Um, and then I moved to Italy to, to start my master's. Uh, I have also worked as a tourist guide during my PhD. So I used to live in Padua, right? And that is very close to Venice. Uh, and I know Venice very well, so every now and then I would, I would take like uh, tourist groups around Venice just to make some money on the side that, while, during my, my PhD. Um, Anna? Yeah, people, just a, a few curiosities about myself. I actually am not a big city girl. We are living in Sao Paulo at the moment, but Sao Paulo even is like too big for me. I was raised, well, I was born in Belo Horizonte, but I was raised in Santa Maria, in Rio de Janeiro. Um, my grandfather used to have a farm and I actually uh, grew up in this farm. Like most of my free time was spent in this farm. And this is what I think have um, influenced my decision to study uh, animal studies in um, apply in application to literature. This is what I do now at the moment. Like I study the representation of animals in literature of all kinds, mostly Brazilian literature and literatures in English. But I think this is this actually has a lot to do with it. Um, and also in my past young self, I was uh, a musician. At the moment, I don't play very much. Uh, I don't have much of the time of doing that now, but I, I played the flute and in um, I think in one of my my past lives, I used to play in an orchestra. <laughs> it's been a long time. I was uh, 15 or 16 when I started and I played until I was 21. That's when I moved to Curitiba and then I stopped, uh, but I really love playing. I used to have bands, a rock band with my brother. He used to play the drums. And nowadays I only sing in the shower and this is mostly what I can do. <laughs> and finally, even if it doesn't really look like, it doesn't show very much, but me and Anna, we're both like very, a huge heavy metal fans, you know? So uh, next month, for example, we're going to Rock in Rio for, to, to watch the rock concerts and Iron Maiden and all of that. So th this is a funny joke that I love, right? I'm a huge metal fan. Me too, right? <laughs> or we too, actually. Um, so a, a little bit of a meme there. Okay, guys. So what is a book a month? Now that you already know the teachers, how, what, what is the school? As I said in, in the beginning, it is a method to, to practice and improve language, okay? Uh, at the moment, we only work with English, but we have plans one day to actually to grow that. I, I would love to have... Uh, a, a German course, actually, because I wanted to be a student in it. So, but I could not be the teacher, right? So we have to find people to work with us. But, but at the moment, we're using the method to, pra to practice and improve uh, English as a foreign language while learning about literature, right? So we're focusing on literature and getting many advantages on the language side as a collateral effect, let's say. So in a book a month, uh, language is not the is not the objective per se. Language is the means for us to to get to somewhere else. So at some point we will even our idea of, of the learning process here and, and of the discussions is that at some point you will even forget that you're not speaking Portuguese. That's that's the idea behind it. Uh, you'll be like talking and exchanging ideas and you read in English, you watched the class in 
English and then you discuss with your colleagues in English. So we are we're creating uh, an artificial immersion. Let's put it this way. We're creating an, an artificial immersion. So some people go abroad to study and, and, and that's great because you can, you can practice your foreign language in the supermarket or while you catch a bus. But we can also create this artificially uh, in, in courses such as a book a month. This is one of our ideas. And, and why? Why mixing language practice and literature? Okay. Why not discussing like random themes? Why not? Uh, I don't know. We could get like newspapers uh, texts and, and discuss those. Why using literature? Okay. So Anna, can you help me out here? Yeah, people. So this is actually a story that has accompanied me for a long time. Um, I have always used reading in class as part of my methods for teaching, right? Um, I think, well, Gabi has been my student at the university, so she remembers that, right? And one of the things that was um, a bit frustrating is how, I how much I believed in the method and how little was, um, how little could I really use this in class, right? Mostly because, um, the teaching of uh, languages and English in particular in schools or universities at the moment, they're still very like um, strict and it's uh, according to rules that are a little bit outdated. So um, I always wanted to experiment. And with experimentation, like the, the first thing that I uh, started doing in class was introducing reading uh, to the students, right? Mostly because this is what I did to improve my English. When I moved to England uh, in 2013, um, my level of English was barely a B2, it was barely the necessary to, to be better. And what happened was, um, although I didn't have like much social life because I was doing my master's, so, uh, and it's, I was a foreigner in the North of England, um, I used to read a lot in most of my time, and I used to write about what I was reading. And this for sure was something that helped me the most uh, improving my English. By the end of the year, my English, I took a test, was C1, right? So this is a, like a drastic change. I noticed a difference. My professors at the university, they noticed a difference because I think that in the beginning of the year, I was struggling a little bit with language. And then by the end of the year, as I had exposed myself to the, of course, the cultural immersion of living in a foreign country, but also um, producing um, a lot of what I, I, I thought it would be interesting for me to improve. Uh, people, Michelle is saying that the connection is unstable. Is it unstable for you as well? No, is it okay? All right. Um, so, so this is one of the things that I, I find uh, fascinated about using literature and about using texts and narratives in order to expand uh, your language awareness, uh, mostly because this is like authentic material. It's not something that we edit in order to find and to uh, expose the students to something that we want them to learn, right? It's uh, through authentic material that you're going to be challenged to learn more and to um, absorb what the text is offering you. Um, and for that, you can, you, you can be ex, uh, exposed to different kinds of sets of vocabulary. For instance, um, in 2020, I think we were reading Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Possibly you're very, uh, you are already familiar with this text. And it's a beautiful text that does have, uh, one of the main subjects is, uh, a trial, right? So one of the things that I, I did in class was mostly using like this kind of law vocabulary in order to teach the students how they could expand the knowledge of uh, vocabulary about law, about trials, right? What can be also um, very useful if you're watching, for example, TV series about the subject, law and order, uh, or the things, or um, drop that diva if you, if you like this kind of uh, TV series. So this is something that uh, literature can expand uh, your vocabulary and also 
uh, reach other parts, other sections of your lives. And also, I think that one of the things that interests us the most about using literary texts is um, how context can teach you uh, a lot about uh, what you're trying to learn, even if you're trying to learn like in a very um, receptive way rather than uh, actively. Just by reading a word several times in the context, even if you don't stop to look at the dictionary, um, the, the third time it appears, you're probably going to get what the meaning is, right? Even if you don't make uh, much effort about it. So uh, literature can be very uh, interesting uh, for doing, um, for you to expand your repertoire of vocabulary, but also for you to see how the grammar, how the syntax, and how the structure of the language works in context. Because this is what it's important. It's not about learning only language, chunks of language that are separated from the context. And then sometimes when you are exposed to the main context, you don't know how to reproduce it, right? So it's something that um, can be uh, very uh, a useful tool if you're trying to, to learn more in-depth language, right? So I think Audio agrees with me as well. And uh, he can uh, tell you about his own experience. Yeah, so one, one concept that is key for us here in Nabucca Month is using intuition, okay? So intuitive grammar and, and an intuitive approach to um, embracing vocabulary, right? So when I had Portuguese classes uh, at high school, uh, I was not very much into grammar, I have to admit, even though I studied letters and, and languages later on, I took many courses in linguistics, I did not really like the Portuguese classes. And one of my problems was with the rules. There were so many rules and, and often the rules did not make sense, but still my grades were pretty good. And they were pretty good because I had a very good intuition of how, you know, intuitively i knew like now this this sounds weird this sounds great so um and and i got that because i read a lot so if you want to speak better portuguese what you're gonna do you're gonna read that's why uh, we we teach uh, literature this is this is one of the reasons why we teach literature in high school and, and this is one of the reasons why we want our our kids to read a lot right so reading more improves your your portuguese and the same thing applies to foreign languages so if you want to have better english uh, or any language uh, for that matter um, you should read okay and reading will challenge you not only linguistically but but also in in co cognitive also socially right so literature is very motivating that's one of the things that we often struggle with with many things not only with with practicing language but, but also practicing exercise for example motivation is often uh difficult to attain to to attain right to obtain and it's also difficult to keep to to to, to keep always motivated so literature can help with that and literature will also encourage uh, interaction. So we read, and, and often when we read a book, we feel that we want to share with someone, we want to discuss it with someone. Uh, so we can use this, this urge to discuss uh, and, and, and practice in class, right? So, so it's a perfect subject matter for conversation practice, right? And um, there's also a humanistic feel to it because literature educates the whole person. Right, so uh, literature will touch on so many subjects on the nature of reality, what is happiness, uh, what should I do with my life, how should I behave regarding others, and etc. Right, so there are many things about our societies and our lives that will be dis that will be discussed in, in, in literature. I'll give you a few examples uh, shortly. Right, so. Uh, there, there are all these advantages, and but but we don't even need the, those actually. I, um, I've dedicated so many years of my life to literature, right? So uh, it's it's not a surprise that I love it. I love it very much. Uh, Anna does too. Uh, so I think we don't really have to to find to to search for for many many reasons. Actually, literature is great. It's it's a lot of fun. So I think that's enough of a reason. It's very very fun. Right. So and, and we have all these benefits on the side, but but even if they were not there, 
uh, even if your, your English did not improve, let's say, still literature is great and it's worthy uh, reading and, and discussing, right? Okay, so one, one thing that I we want also to, to stress is that we've been there, okay? Uh, we also have the same path and we do follow the same path in other uh, contexts. So uh, we're both polyglots. Anna speaks five languages. I speak six. Uh, we're both studying German since a few years already. And as you know, life is too short to learn German, right? <laughs> but, but we're trying, we're doing our best. Uh, and we, we acquired those, those languages in, in various ways, okay? Uh, of course, they're not all at the same level. There is variation. But in the way we learn them, uh, there's also variation. So, um, for example, in my case, I've, when I finished high school, I could already speak English and Spanish. I, I had graduated on the, I, I would be studying those at the side in my school. Uh, when I went to university, I've learned French and Italian. My major in university was in Italian literature and also Brazilian literature. Uh, that's why I took my master's in Italy and my PhD in Italy later on. And then at the very end of university, I started start studying German. Uh, I studied for, for a few years by myself. My German is still pretty bad, uh, a low intermediate, I would say I am. Um, I can read with a lot of difficulties and that's what I want. I don't really want to speak German. It's not that I want to have phone calls, you know, like call someone and talk in German. It doesn't interest me very much. What, what I care about is reading. Uh, I want to read philosophy in German. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm aiming very high, as you can see. I would like to read Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and, and, Heide, and Heidegger in German one day, perhaps. Let, let's hope I live enough. So, um, so, so this, I, I'm mostly interested with reading. Uh, and, and a funny thing happened uh, um, one year and a half ago. I was in Barcelona during my PhD. No, it was one year and a half before the pandemic. Okay. Uh, Pandemic was uh, was a time period that I, I forgot about, right? So, but one one a year and a half before the pandemic, I was in the middle of my PhD and I went to Barcelona for a conference, and I visited one of Gaudí's houses. And at the end, there was a book that I thought was in French uh, called Modernisme, right, with an e in the end. So I thought, okay, it's French. I I got the book. I read two paragraphs and I understood everything. But then I was like, man, this French is so weird that there were many things weird. And actually I realized this was not French, this was Catalan, okay? But because I can speak French and Portuguese and, and Italian, I could mix up those and understand pretty much everything the text was. So it was a real surprise. And, and, uh, and this was a lot of fun. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, Anna can give you her example with Spanish, actually. His phone started ringing. <laughs> Let me just... Can you hear the sound? Okay, so um, better then. So, well, my thing with Spanish was always that I hated Spanish. And I don't know if you relate to that, mostly because we are bad Latin Americans. We don't interact much with our peers and we should, we should speak Spanish, right? I think it's something that we all can try to do, right? Um, and also they should try to speak uh, Portuguese. It's something that I'm trying to do this uh, since, well, it's been a long time since I've been trying to learn more Spanish and I've never studied it in like a formal course, right? I only did it uh, through immersion, cultural immersion and also on my own, right? I'm very bad at trying to learn uh, grammar uh, on my own. I usually I need assistance, but for somehow I think the Spanish was easier, mostly because it's very similar to Portuguese. So it was uh, easier to intuitively learn more about it. So what I would do when I was hanging out with some um, Spanish-speaking friends, I used to live in when I lived in Spain. I used to live with a Colombian and a Spanish girl. And I used to have like my conjugation verbs next to me. And every time I wanted to speak something, I would try to use the verbs and ask them to help me, right? So this, this was my method. Besides that, what I did was mostly like expose myself to different kinds of um, authentic materials, for instance, TV series, films, 
um, and reading. Yeah, so I started reading uh, profusely in Spanish in order to be able to grasp more or less how the, um, the language works. Mostly because I was studying in a Spanish university and at the point uh, when I first arrived in, in Spain, I didn't have like much of a master of the language. So I had to deal with it. Like on my own, I have to deal with it. And it was possible to do. Nowadays, um, I, I am able to perform academic Spanish and also to give lectures in Spanish and to attend le uh, lectures and uh, lessons in Spanish as well, right? But this was uh, mainly due to my own effort because I didn't, I didn't really uh, have a formal course. So you can see that it's possible to do it. Even if you don't like master the language itself, like if you don't, don't have like a C2 level, you're able to increase the level with your own um, self-study methods, right? It's possible to do it. And reading, it's the one that is cheapest, right? You can just take a book, read it more, and also uh, watch some things on, uh, on the, the, the language. Uh, sorry, guys. Tim wanted to sell me a new phone line or something. Uh, I, I was I was telling you about the, this book, right? So I, I since I, I I had to go there to get the phone, I got the book to show you. And this is the book I bought it. Uh, Modernisme, and then right uh, here at the bottom is written La Belleza du Mouvement Artistique Unique. I don't read any Catalan. It's written it's written there Catala, right? I don't read Catalan. I, I didn't know I could read actually because. When we speak Portuguese, you read this, la belleza do movimento artistique unique. It, it's pretty obvious what, you're, what we're talking about, right? So um, although I do not speak Catalan, I could read this book uh, with some difficulty sometimes. And we have the internet, right? So every time I got to a word I could not really understand, I could not guess what it meant, I would go online and search for it and Google Translator and things like that. They really, really help. So reading in foreign languages is something we are doing on a regular basis. Uh, and we have used in other periods of our lives to, uh, to practice. Uh, right now, we, we often read many books uh, at the same time, right? And, and right now, for example, I'm reading this one, which is in Italian. Okay, Cuore uh, Cicatrizzati, which is the one in the middle there. In the, uh, it's, a, it's a Romanian author, uh, which uh, who has been translated into Portuguese only last year, I think, for the first time. So when I bought this book, I used to live in Italy, and, and it was not available in Portuguese. So this is also one of the, the, the reasons for us to read in other languages, especially if you're interested in literature. Often you cannot really find some authors, if you want to read, for example, Chinese literature or African literatures or Japanese literature, it, you don't find everybody, you don't find that many translations sometimes. So it is useful to read in English uh, as well. Um, and the same thing, the other two books I'm, I'm reading now, The Architecture of Hope, which is this one, is a huge book. Um, it's in English and The Warm at the Core as well. Uh, and while Anna uh, was reading, I think you've already finished, right? At a Theaters of Glass? Yeah, yeah. It's a, about uh, the woman who invented the aquarium. The kind of things that I have to do for the postdoc. It's very nice. <laughs> uh, and also and I'm reading... <laughs> uh, yes, and also I'm reading about octopus, which is my latest addiction. I'm fascinated about octopus, so I'm reading about uh, uh, other kinds of minds. And because I do have a conference in La Plata in Argentina uh, by the end of the year, I'm trying to read more in, in Spanish and to listen more um, books in Spanish. So I'm reading Fyodor Dostoevsky's El Cocodrilo, <laughs> which is very nice. So uh, whenever I try to refresh uh, the language, I, I read more in the language, I listen more in the language and I watch more in the language. This is usually the kind of things that we can do in order to refresh vocabulary and to refresh grammar. Yeah, so that's a key concept. And another core concept for us is that uh, if you do the talk, you have to walk the walk, right? And so uh, we, we see a book a month and not as a top bottom uh, way of teaching. Uh, it's not that we are the teachers and we know everything and then our students are below us and they absorb uh, wisdom is not the way it works. We understand 
um, our efforts here as a horizontal uh, pedagogy, uh, horizontal didactics. So we uh, we we want to create knowledge by through the discussion of everybody, right? So so it's everybody has a participation in it, and we see a book a month more like a study group rather than a course itself. Okay, so let's go to, to the different modalities of our courses. Uh, there are two basic uh, types of courses, uh, novels, which is divided in intermediate and advanced, and short stories, right? So this is the two types, novels in which we read full books, and then short stories in, we, in which we read shorter texts, right? So starting with the novels, uh, in the novels course, we have classes every two weeks. So one week we, there is a class, the other there's not, right? Uh, the classes are longer, about two hours and a half, and we read the first half of the book, right? So we discuss, usually our books are perhaps 150 pages long, 200 or sometimes. So we would read the first half in, in this two weeks period, and then the second half in the second class, right? Uh, the short stories, on the other hand, focuses on short, short stories, on, on shorter texts, texts that have under 10 pages, texts that can be read perhaps in, in half an hour, perhaps even less, okay? And, and there are classes every week, and the classes are a little bit shorter because of that. So it's, the class lasts for an hour and a half. But then you have classes every Tuesdays, right? So in one case, you have fewer classes, but they are longer. In the, in the short stories, you have more classes, more frequent classes, but they are shorter, right? So we try to balance it, it out. And it's all a matter of length, okay? So uh, how, mu how much time you have to read. If you're interested in reading uh, a book a month, like the, the, the name of the school, right? Then the, the novels course is perhaps is, is the best one for you. But if you're interested, uh, for example, in reading shorter texts and getting to know many, many authors, because every semester we, we read nine, sometimes 10 different people, right? So, so you have a lot of exposure to different authors uh, and their style of writing. If you're looking for that, great. Then perhaps short stories is your thing. Okay. Yes, Anna. Yeah, people. So um, the things that I think are very valuable about two the two types of courses mostly is because with short stories are gonna like we're going to meet every week and we're going to read a different text every week, right? But um, and this is very good because we're gonna by the end of the course we're gonna have read several uh, authors, right? Um, but with novels, although we don't, um, we don't meet as often as we do with uh, short stories, the thing that is very interesting about this conviviality with the book is that you're going to spend more time and you're going to develop an affectionate relationship with the book, right? And this often helps you in performing class. The more you are involved uh, with the text, the more you want to talk about it, the more you want to express uh, your opinion about it. So both courses, they do have their their pros. So it's up to you, like deciding uh, what kind of courses are you taking. Yes. Yeah. And uh, usually we, cho we, we choose novels or authors which are somehow connected. OK, so we try to create a certain progression of, of topics, of literary styles, um, Precisely to, you know, you, you have a little bit of difficulty in the first uh, author, and then we want to transfer the, 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 the new knowledge you acquired, you transfer it to the second one and to the third one. So our idea is that it, it will get easier and easier. That's the, the idea behind it. So that's why we organize everything into themes and, and they are somehow connected. Usually the classes are. Um, are thus. Um, they are divided in two parts, more or less. Uh, usually in the beginning, there will be a literary introduction in which I or Anna, uh, we will discuss uh, some key features of the texts, 
Uh, sometimes we'll talk about the historical period. Sometimes we'll talk about the author's life. It depends. It varies very much. Okay. And we do have discussions as well. But usually um, we speak for, a, for, I don't know, like one hour or 30 minutes in the case of a short story course. Uh, and then in the second part of the class, we have the discussion prompts. So um, we, we, engage in interaction, me and Anna, we are asking you questions and then you are debating with us and among uh, the students debate among themselves, precisely for us to, to create, to, to interpret the, the, the text uh, all together, okay? Sometimes we're speaking in the beginning, sometimes this is in verse, so it changes a lot, but in every class there is uh, one exposition by us and then also the, the discussion uh, from the, the, the student side. Yes, Anna. Yes, people. So as we go, what we try to do with, uh, with our literary intro is not only like um, tell you what you have to think about the text, right? It's an invitation to a kind of reading in order to um, actually propose a deeper uh, interpretation of what you already got. Right, and when we do that, we are also inserting some key concepts of literary criticism, mostly to help you know and to recognize what you're reading when you read. For instance, uh, last year we talked a lot uh, in, in in the intermediate groups. We were discussing many adventure books like uh, The Hobbit, Stardust by Neil Gaiman, A Wrinkle in Time by Madeleine Langle and other books of, for example, Jules Verne, um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, right? And the thing is, um, by the time we finished, we, throughout the, the, whole tech, the, the whole semester, we were discussing something that tends to reappear in all these novels in a different form, which is um, the, the theory of the hero, right? Probably have heard about the hero's journey. And uh, it was very interesting because the first time I taught uh, the groups um, about this in the beginning of the semester, by the time when we started reading uh, The Hobbit, which was the last book, people already could recognize how the system would work and they, become, they became better readers, right? They were able to recognize to what kind of tradition was Tolkien interacting with not only on the cultural side, but also on the literary side. So what you get with us is not only like this in-depth quality of the literary interpretation and the language itself and a place to discuss it, but also you will for sure become better readers. Great. Uh, we, we do not really apply grades, okay? There's no real homework. The only homework you get is reading the stuff. OK, um, and but we use a lot of self-assessment and, and as I said before, horizontality. So uh, we are really engaging in a debate. Um, uh, if you, um, your, you yourselves are while you're reading, you will realize um, if it's too difficult of, or if it's too easy. So you'll be self-assessing your capacity and then you can discuss this with us, okay? So we don't really use grades because we are a few students actually. Our, our courses, we, we try to keep it uh, small uh, in, in, a, in such a way that we, we can offer um, attention to everybody detail and then work on the details, okay? The, the weekly reading load, as I said, is not very big. It depends on your time, okay? But, but if you're in a rush and cannot really read that much, um, in the short story courses um, is about less than 10 pages usually, so it's like half an hour perhaps. In the novels intermediate course, it's about 30 pages a week, so perhaps two hours of reading a week. And in the novels advance is a little bit more, perhaps about 50. It, it varies depends on the book, but usually we try, we try to avoid reading like huge novels. I'm Moby Dick, you know, like 800 pages, this book. No, uh, we, we know that everybody's always busy. So we try to keep it uh, low, okay, uh, on the shorter side. And we also uh, uh, create certificates um, uh, at the end of the course, okay? So especially if you, if you want those and, and it's important for you perhaps um, to work or to the university you're on, let us know and we produce those. Yes, Anna. 
Yes, people. So this is um, one thing that is very important to remind you concerning the certificates. The certificates are not only granted about your presence in class, but also the time you spend reading. So usually the certificates are around uh, 50 to 60 hours, which is more or less like 30 hours in presence in class, right, in virtual uh, presence, and other uh, 20 or more, depending on the, the, time, the type of books that we have read this semester, uh, on your independent work, right? So it's not only computated your presence here, but also the time you spend reading on your own. Okay, guys, so let's go to our reading lists. Okay, as I said, we, we try to organize it in themes. So the theme for the novels intermediate course this, this uh, semester is all about ghosts and, and, and sci-fi, right? So we'll be discussing Gothic fiction, actually, okay, and, and horror fiction. Uh, it's not very scary, actually, but, but th that's the name, right? Horror fiction and ghost stories. And then we move little by little into science. So we'll start with uh, Henry James, The Turn of the Screw, well, huge classic, okay, huge classic, amazing text. Uh, it's about 100 pages long, but it's not the easiest either, okay? If you find it difficult, that's okay, that's okay. It's, it's not necessarily your fault. Um, even a native speaker, the kids, the 16 year old kids at high school, when they, they, they are told to read this, they also find it difficult. Okay, so uh, it's feasible, you can do it, but perhaps it won't be uh, like reading in Portuguese. Of course, it will not, right? Because you're a native speaker of Portuguese and we're not native speakers of, of English, none of us, right? Uh, then we, we move into the hunting of a hill house, much easier text, okay, shorter uh, sentences easier vocabulary because it is it is from the 20th century, right? The, the turn of the screw is from the end of the 19th century. Shirley Jackson is, um, um, is a great and amazing, actually, author of ghost stories. She's a, a writer from the USA. Henry James as well, but, but he lived most of his life in, in England. Um, and, and The Hunting of the Hill House is a true masterpiece. Uh, those two are often uh, cited and quoted uh, and considered by critics to be among the best ghost stories, among the best examples of Gothic fiction, okay? So that's why we chose it. They, they're just, just perfect. They're very interesting. The, 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 the plot is, is great. It's very entertaining. And they are also very important historically and not so big. So many advantages. We will move into H.P. Lovecraft, okay, uh, an author from the U.S. as well in the 1930s, 20s, okay, so beginning of the 20th century. He wrote a lot of short stories. He's very famous for The Call of Cthulhu, for example, which is about, uh, he, he loved to write about aliens and stuff like this. So in this, in this uh, short uh, novella, uh, at the Mountains of Madness. It is about 100 pages long as well. And it's about um, a mission that goes to Antarctica. And once they get into the Arctic, they discover the classic story. They, they get to the camp, everybody disappeared. They, they, they solve the mystery. And then they realize that they discover a, a, an alien civilization that is living in the depths of Antarctica. It's very nice. It's not very scary. He's famous as being a horror writer, but but uh, it's very interesting actually. Okay, and then we move into Kurt Vonnegut, The Slaughterhouse Number Five, which is a classic uh, from the 1960s. Super funny. This book is hilarious. Okay, uh, it's about World War II, a soldier that is like, abducted by aliens, uh, and when he comes back to Earth. He has this knowledge about time and, and he's very sarcastic. So we're seeing many things which are terrible actually because we're seeing World War II, but through his eyes, through the eyes of someone who uh, takes everything as a joke. So it is a very interesting book, very well written. And then we move into Douglas Adams, one of uh, uh, 
uh, an icon of pop culture, right? Perhaps some of you have already read the book in Portuguese, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is also uh, a very funny book. Um, and, and so we we'll create this, this path from, from horror to, to, to the comic genre and, and always tying ghosts with uh, uh, extraterrestrial life, okay? Uh, Indian novels advanced course, we'll be talking about different uh, configurations of love, okay? So we'll talk about uh, the classic uh, marriage stories, right, in the, in the beginning of the course. In Persuasion by Jane Austen, great author, perhaps one of the most important authors ever. Um, and uh, this book is our favorite, both mine and Anna's, is about uh, a marriage that was delayed in seven years, right? So um, a boy meets girl, they, 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 they get in love, but the families to not wish them to, to be married and they, they accept the will of the families. And, and so um, we, they, they do not marry, they, they broke up be, because of their families. And so we get the story of what happens after that, once they meet again seven years later. So it's a very nice book, super funny as well. Jane Austen is, she's filled with irony, uh, very tactile, um, narration. So it's, it's, it's a great masterpiece and it's not a difficult one to read. So uh, this is also one of the, the great things about this text. Yes, Anna. I just wanted to ask you if you have ever read something by Jane Austen before. I think some of you have mentioned. Um, I think Abby has, right? Chris, I think as well. I'm not sure. Yes, I've read like 20, uh, 20 years ago, Pride and Prejudice. Okay. <laughs> yes. But I'm I'm enjoying much more um persuasion. Persuasion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> me, too, me too, yeah. <laughs> it's less long, right? And I think well it's more mature because Pride and Prejudice, it's about like a 20-year-old starting her own investigation of identity. And then mm -hmm. in persuasion, mm -hmm. we do have a more mature uh, character who is like dealing with her own frustrations and feelings mm -hmm, and learning mm -hmm. how to navigate life. So it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Gabby yeah, has also read for the actually, yeah. Because the yeah. second book, A Room with a View by, by Ian Foster, he's also a great master. He has written remarkably little, actually. He wrote like four or five books only in his entire life. Uh, and A Room with a View is the second book. And it's already a masterpiece. And it's about a young lady that goes on a trip to Italy in the beginning of the 20th century. It's a, it's a moment in history in which women are starting to, to free themselves a little bit from, from the chains of the 19th century. So it's very interesting, this woman earning her in, independence and being very critical of society, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ironic way. So it's also quite funny, quite light. Um, uh, yeah, you laugh a lot while, while re reading it, right? Uh, then we move into uh, Five Little Pigs by Agatha Christie, a mystery uh, story, as uh, you could expect, uh, about um, a marriage that did not work well. So um, the wife apparently killed the husband, and then Poirot has to solve the mystery, and so we have a different, five different suspects. So it is, it is uh, one of her most famous uh, stories. And, and I always love detective fiction to, 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 to discuss with in, the, in the group. It's always a lot of fun. Then we will read an Italian author, okay, Elena Ferrante, uh, in, in English translation, a very good translation, by the way, The Lost Dog, okay, about a woman that kind of steals a, a doll from, from a girl she meets at the beach. And, and you have a pretty weird story going on. She's somehow, she identifies with the girl and with her daughter. So um, you have a, a misplaced relationship of mother and, and daughter, right? So uh, it's, it's also very interesting. And, and finally, we, we move into the hours. A, uh, a book by Michael Cunningham, which is um, a book which is which was published uh, much more recently and which won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, 
perhaps the most important prize in the English language, right? And, and not everybody that, that got the Nobel, in my opinion, deserved it. But, but so far, everybody I've read that won the Pulitzer, really, uh, I was always amazed. So uh, I, I never had the same feeling that reading someone who got the, the, this prize and, and feeling like, yeah, they, they, they really, they should not have uh, received it. So, and, and the story was, uh, became very famous because of the film as ready uh, as well, right? So the, the movie came out a few years ago, The Hours. I, I know Anna loves it. Yeah, and it's, um, I think like the first time I read this book, I was still in university during my undergraduate years. And I was at the time, the same time I was reading Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And I don't know if you ever read anything by Virginia Woolf, but uh, if you were with us in the last year, you read Orlando. If not, uh, you can read a little bit about uh, Mrs. Dalloway so you can get in touch more or less of what it is. And um, so it's, it's a type of narrative. It's this kind of books that have like three lives happening at the same time and somehow they are connected by a theme, right? And in this case, we're talking about um, Virginia Woolf's uh, novel, Mrs. Dalloway, which is like the epithet of uh, modernism and modernist writing and stream of consciousness. So it's very interesting. The movie is amazing. Um, but you, you can watch it after you read, but it's with uh, Mary Strip and Julianne Moore and also with uh, Nicole Kidman as Regina Woolf, right? So it's pretty nice. Great. Uh, and then finally, in the short stories course, we'll discuss eight different authors the, until December. We'll start with three short stories by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, uh, the, one of the masters of, of gothic fiction, right? So we will read many of his uh, famous stories, The Black Cat, uh, The Mask of the Red Death, and The Cask of Amontillado, right? So, oh, this one is great. I, I love, I love them all. Um, Anna will be teaching uh, this course. Uh, then we'll move into Shirley Jackson, the same author of The Hunting of Hill House. So we will read one novel in the intermediate uh, uh, course, but also we will read two of her short stories in the short story course. Then uh, a very funny short story by Oscar Wilde, uh, The Ghost of the Canterville, uh, which is super funny. Uh, Oscar Wilde was very critic of, of uh, England in general, and, and he makes a lot of fun of, of British culture. Uh, then we moved into uh, Ursula Le Guin, a little bit of fantasy here, uh, also a little bit of sci-fi. Le Guin is, is hailed as one of the greatest sci-fi writers ever. Uh, she's from the US, okay? And, and, and she does not receive the, as much respect as she deserves, actually. She should be uh, more well-known, in my opinion. People who love sci-fi know about her, but the general public does not really, and it's a pity because it, she's extremely talented. Then we will read Vladimir Nabokov, the, the writer of Lolita and, and, and etc. So he's Russian, right? But but wrote uh, so much of his, so many of his texts in, in English uh, and, and some he wrote in Russian, but then he translated himself into English. We will read Chinua Achebe, which is, uh, who is a, a Nigerian writer, uh, that, that became extremely famous in the 70s when he published a book called Things Fall Apart, which is a masterpiece. And, and this, this book is one of the most important works of post-colonial literature, right? So um, he, his native language is not English, it's Igbo, but he decided to write in English uh, as a foreign language, and he decided to write in a broken English on purpose. So there are the, the sentences are very short. Sometimes there are mistakes. Sometimes they're even childish. And the narrative, even though the language is so simple, the narrative is absolutely brilliant, very poetic, very beautiful, um, very moving as well. So um, uh, Things Fall Apart is one of the books that we, we, we hope to, to discuss one day here in a book a month. And in the short story course, we'll be discussing two of his texts. He's very talented as well. Then we move to Flannery O'Connor, uh, 
uh, a writer from the U.S. Um, she's her her texts are very spicy. They're, they're um, um, one of them is about a serial killer, for example. The other one is about a preacher that uh, they always have this surprising end, this twist at the end. Uh, very nice to read. And I, and I love both of the, the short stories that we will read. And finally, we, we end up with Mark Twain, an author from the end of the 19th century. Very, very funny uh, and extremely important for, for the literature in the USA. Okay. Uh, a few tips on how to plan your scatty, your, your reading routine. So first thing, first thing, don't panic. Okay. <laughs> and, and it's easy to panic. We know everybody's running the whole time. We don't want to, to put them like to make your lives more difficult and, and heavier. So uh, don't panic. If you if you could not read it, uh, you had no time, you had to travel, you fell sick, whatever happened, there's no big deal. Okay, you can come to class, even without reading, we will um, discuss the, the narrative. Yeah, you will learn what will happen, probably. So perhaps a little bit of the surprise will you will lose a little bit of the surprise but but still uh, if you're finding it difficult perhaps this problem will be solved in class so usually we advise our students to come to class even if you haven't finished it okay if you cannot come uh there's no problem we record all the classes and, and store them in the cloud so you can watch it later if you want to watch it once again uh, you can do it as many times you want, okay? So, uh, for example, you read, you watch the class without reading it, for example, and then you read the, the chapters, and then you want to watch the class again. That's fine. So, okay, so they recorded there for you. Anna? People, so what's really important is that we will never ask you direct questions, right? Like, for example, how to tell me what this story is about and what happens in chapter five. Right. We will never ask this kind of questions. We'll never expose you. We'll never put you on spot. Right. What we will create in the discussions is um, possibility for you to dialogue among yourselves and also as part of the bigger group. Right. Um, what we usually do in classes as well, we uh, use this device that uh, that Zoom offers, which is called breakout rooms. And in these breakout rooms, you're gonna to you're going to be able to discuss the text among yourselves without us listening to it all the time. We can visit you, but also you have the independence to talk on your own with your classmates, right? So no judgment, no direct questions. If you cannot uh, read for some kind, for some reason, whatever, uh, just come to class. Don't be afraid. We're not going to expose you uh, that you didn't read, right? And uh, the important thing is like being in class because uh, mostly if we're talking about novels, if you don't come to one class, then you already have missed like half of our meetings. So try to come, try to make this a habit. And I think that if you do some of this uh, reading plan that we are uh, trying to, to help you out with in this presentation today, probably you're going to be able to organize your reading habits um, with more awareness. But if it happens, come to class anyway, right? It's important that you come. Yeah, we, we advise you to stack habits. It's something that we do, so to pile them up. So I don't know, perhaps you have to catch a bus every day, 30 minutes. Great, so you can read in the bus. Or you can, I don't know, listen to an audiobook while you're taking your breakfast. I don't know, whatever you do. Um, you, you could try to stack habits. Uh, it, it helps, okay? I use this, and I think um, if you establish your goals and check your progress, it's more likely you keep motivated, and, and that's very important, okay? Um, one thing, when we're reading, especially the older texts, the texts by Henry James, for example, uh, there are many words which we kind of understand in context, but we don't really know what they are. Uh, so there are two strategies here, okay? The first one is on, on general terms, what I usually tell students, don't stop to check every single word, okay? You don't have to understand every single word to, to, to keep on reading. I would advise 
understanding 85, 90% of the text. If you're feeling that you're not really getting what is happening, so then perhaps you should, should check a few words. But uh, on average, I would say, just go ahead, unless you notice that a word is very important, just go with the flow and you'll be fine. Unless you're the type of person that likes to check every single word. And I, I am such a person, right? So when I'm reading Catalan, uh, and I find something difficult. I stop and I look for it and uh, and I have fun this way, but I know that some people do not. So uh, find what is what works out for you, okay? Uh, and if you have difficulties in finding it, talk with us, we can, we can give you a few ideas, okay? And uh, a few uh, words on how to get the books, okay? So what, when those books are publicly available in public domain, we provide them to you. For example, uh, I will send you uh, tomorrow the uh, Henry James, okay, the, the the Turn of the Screw, which is uh, is a book that is in public domain as well as persuasion for them. Uh, but when they are not, there are other ways you can find it. Okay, so uh, the other books like uh, The Last Daughter by Elena Ferrand. This book is was published like less than ten years ago, so it's very recent. Uh, you can, it's not in public domain. So we cannot really provide it to you. I would love, I could, but you know, I love my bed. I don't want to be sleeping in jail for, for too much time. So, so that's why we don't, we don't provide you the books, but the, the students can, can exchange among yourselves and, and they often do. Okay. But there are many ways to find books online. So here are our tips. You can look for digital books. Let's start or better. Let's start on the right. Real books, you, you like to read real stuff with pages and paper. So um, you can buy them in Amazon, in whatever library you prefer, uh, in whatever bookshop. Um, I, I advise you to check Stanchi Virtual, okay? They are secondhand, but sometimes you can get books in English uh, very cheap, very, very cheap. Uh, in Amazon, you often have to pay for import, importation taxes, and it takes so long. So, and the shipping is is, is it costs a lot. So, perhaps Stanley Plow can solve your problem. There are many ways you can find digital books as well. Okay, so one possibility is using Kindle Unlimited. You pay a monthly fee, and then you have free access. To the database, that's a possibility. It's not very expensive and it works quite well. Uh, me and Anna, we, we use Script. I don't know if you heard about this. It's the, the one in the middle here. Script, you pay a monthly uh, fee uh, and then you have access to many digital books and to audio books and etc. Most of the readings we will uh, propose in this semester. Uh, you can find them there. Um, for the first two weeks or the first month, it's for free. And then you start paying later on, okay? So we use it. We, they're not giving us any money, but we, we find it. We advise you, you could uh, look for, for, for books over there. Then there is the Internet Archive, which is a great website that um, offers uh, books that are available in libraries in the USA, okay? So... You can find many things over there. You have to create an account. It's 100% free, okay? Uh, but you have to have a login and then you can borrow the books as if you were borrowing it from the library, okay? Anna? People, Internet Archive is brilliant. Usually they have like some editions that we don't find elsewhere. And uh, yeah, actually, I use this on a daily basis. Uh, usually when I'm trying to find some theory book or something that it's difficult to find elsewhere in Brazil, I go to Internet Archive and usually they have it, right? So whenever you cannot find the book, you can go to Internet Archive. And it's not only about digital books, also about films, old films, recent films, they also have it, right? So it's quite interesting. And it's like .org is not something that is like piracy or anything. It's it's um, it's uh, something that is permitted to do, as far as we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, like the uh, the printing presses have been trying to to put the this, the website down for a few years already, but but so far they're doing fine. Okay. Uh, 
then we have the audiobooks, and uh, we love it. Uh, I love audiobooks. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Um, I think they save so much time. You, you will never look to your dishes the same way, okay? You will look like, yeah, let me wash the dishes because I can listen to a, a little bit to my book. So I advise you to look for LibriVox. The, those books are all recorded by volunteers and they are 100% free, okay? Uh, but they only have books that are publicly available, so in public domain. Books that have copyright, you cannot find it in LibriVox. Then you can find those in YouTube quite often, okay? Uh, so you, it's worth the checking. Uh, and then there are two great companies that I use a lot. Audible, which is by Amazon, and they have amazing recordings, uh, and also audiobooks.com. Audible, when you create your profile, you get a first book but for free. So you can create it, get the free book, and cancel it. So that's a tip. And you can do this with both of them, actually, with Audible and with audiobooks.com. So in both cases, you get a free book. There are the other possibilities. You can find a few books in Spotify and Storytel as well. Uh, and Skilo, as far as I know, it's a Brazilian uh, website for, for audiobooks. They have it in English as well. I've never used it, but, but some people told me it works fine. I think it's like 20 reals or something. You pay a monthly fee. So people, um, Paulo asked a very interesting question on chat, like if reading audiobooks is like the same thing as reading, right? This is a current debate that has been going on for a long time. People have been talking about the subject. And the thing is like, in terms of comprehension of texts, if it's not like a modernist, modernist te text like James Joyce, uh, Ulysses or Mrs. Dalloway by, um, Virginia Woolf, then you're fine, right? If it's too complicated, too experimental, then you're better off like reading the, the paperback or the, the, the text with your eyes, right? You read it with your eyes. But the thing is like when you read uh, an audiobook, sometimes you're gonna have like different layers of understanding of the text. Uh, what I um, recently heard from students is saying like, uh, I didn't understand like who is who in this text, but then when I read the other book, it was better to understand, mostly because we have different voices and then intonation helps to better grasp what is happening in the story. So sometimes it can be even better than reading the paperback edition, right? But in terms of um, uh, spelling, or writing, then maybe you should, all, if you want to read the other book, you can also use um like a, a visual aid like getting the the proper book itself like the text itself in order for you to visualize it as well right so it can help you in many ways i think well i'm very pro to uh to reading audiobooks i myself am better um i do have like um i do have better memory when i listen to things and um but it, it might be different for you. So you should analyze your own method and try to engage with that. Yes. And yes, so Paulo was also uh, asking about, about reading both at the same time. I think it's a great idea. I usually do it mostly with languages that I feel more challenged um, uh, when, I, when I read, like German, like uh, French and such. So I think it's, it's a tool to help you out with many things. Sometimes we do have like different uh, words on text that we don't, it doesn't like the pronunciation doesn't come naturally. So when you listen to the other book, you'll listen to someone speaking it. Therefore you are learning not only how to use the word, but also how to pronounce it and how to incorporate it in your vocabulary, right? So it can be beneficial for um, many reasons but also because it's, uh, it can offer you a, like a deeper understanding of the text as well. Yeah. And, and then there is piracy. I mean, we cannot provide it to you, but I don't know what you're doing over there in your PC and I don't care. We're not looking, right? So if you want to find the, the, the books online, uh, these are three possibilities. Library Genesis, uh, which is a web Russian website in which there are millions of books, uh, Z Library as well. So in both of them, you can find um, many books 
which are copyrighted. If, you, if you're looking for the PDF edition, you can often find it there. We cannot provide it to you, but we don't know what you're doing uh, on the side. <laughs> and we're not selling any books here, so feel free to, to, uh, to do it as much as you would like. And also, uh, some of the students, are sometimes they're sharing it in WhatsApp or Google Drive or whatever. Okay, uh, just a few comments on our calendar. We'll be finishing in five to 15 minutes, don't worry. Uh, so our calendar, in August, we'll be reading those, no those authors and, and novels, right? So Novels Intermediate starts next week on Thursday. We will read chapters one to 12 of The, Turni the Turn of the Screw. Then uh, on set, there are two, um, two different groups of ad novels advanced. And, and I, I misplaced the dates here, sorry guys. So actually the Saturday course is, start, is, is starting on the 13th, okay? So it's a Saturday, next Saturday. And then on the 27th, the sex of the first part, the first 12 chapters of the book, and then the, the last 12 chapters. And on Thursday, the 18th is a, is a Thursday, it's not a Saturday. Uh, then it is starting the, the Thursday group, right? So, so in two weeks time. In the meantime, on the 16th, uh, we'll start discussing The Black Cat of, by Edgar Allan Poe, and we'll go on discussing uh, texts by Poe uh, throughout the month. Uh, the, the other week, The Cask of Amontillado, and then the other one, The Mosque of the Red Death. I forgot to tell you, but on the short story course, we provide all the short stories to you because they're, they're so tiny and they're just a fraction of the books. Most of them are already in public domain, but even those that are not there, they're just a fraction which we are allowed to, to, uh, to offer by law, okay? Uh, then a few tips to help you, uh, because I think you were born to read in English and in, 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 in many languages, right? So some of the tips that we often cover. First, manage your expectations, okay? Reading in a foreign language is not the same as reading in Portuguese. Uh, you will understand less, and that's normal. That's part of the process. And you will read slower, okay? Uh, so sometimes it is frustrating because we have the expectation that we can just open the book and get the same feeling. It's not, okay? That's okay. You don't have to despair. It will get better with time. Okay, so if it's too hard, um, it is good to understand why. Perhaps the vocabulary is old, okay? Uh, for example, that's the case with the turn of the screw. The vocabulary is a little bit old, and so it's not so intuitive. Sometimes uh, the vocabulary is informal, right? So uh, if you're watching a movie, and there are like gangs in New York and they're fighting if they're speaking like the English from the ghetto. Uh, it's much more difficult to understand. They're using a lot of slangs. They're using a lot of broken grammar. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to understand for us. So it could be too informal, okay? Perhaps the structure, the grammatic structure is too complex, okay? Uh, it happens not on those narratives that we chose, Okay, but, but it could happen on your, your life. If you're trying to read in English, it could be the problem. Or the theme could be too complicated. If you're trying to read about astrophysics, you may think that the problem is your English, but actually the problem would be that the subject matter, not necessarily the, thing, the language. And that is important for us here because often uh, students may confuse a little uh, what, what, when the problem is linguistic and when the problem is literary, okay? So sometimes you understand all the words, but you don't really get what they mean in the context, okay? Uh, and, and that's, some authors, they do this on purpose. Some texts aren't more difficult. So the difficulty, perhaps it's not in your English, but it is in the book itself. Okay, so for example, last semester we read uh, a chronicle of a death foretold by Garcia Marquez, right? And I love this book. 
and it's extremely confusing. The story like goes back and forward the whole time. There are so many characters. They have very weird names. And so it's, it's very complicated for you to understand what is going on, actually. The English, however, is not, it's not difficult. It, it's easy. Short sentences, uh, 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 vocabulary is very like, down to earth. But the, the way he tells the story is very confusing. And, and that is created on, on purpose, uh, right? Uh, so that is a, one example when the problem is literary and not linguistic. Okay? Third tip, practice makes perfect. The, the, the proverb, like in Portuguese, right? Practice makes perfect. So we have to be consistent. We, uh, unfortunately, the coaches, they all lie to us. Unfortunately, it's not possible to learn English in two months, right? As, as many people tell us that it's possible. Uh, I wish, I wish they were right. I wish we could. I would love to learn German in two months rather than 20 years, but, but it's not possible. Okay, if it is possible, please let me know. <laughs> but as far as I have uh, experienced, and I have quite a lot of experience, um, it's not possible. You have to be consistent, okay? So uh, we, I would advise you to use progressions in a smart way. And, and that's why we organize it thematically. Don't expect an immediate transformation. So, you know, it doesn't come from in, in 24 hours, it takes a few months, but, but trust me, you will realize, um, uh, you will notice the difference, but the results are a difficult, they, they are a little bit difficult to measure. It's not like going on a diet and that, that you can, you know, oh, I had, I don't know, 65 and now I have 63, you know, it's a bit different than that because it's difficult to measure, but uh, overall you will notice much improvement. You will notice it will get easier and easier. Okay, yes, Anna. Yes, I think that sometimes the the progress might be so subtle that it could be in a way that you find it less difficult and less difficult, and then it's just fine for you to read in a foreign language, right? And the more you progress, the more uh, the easier it's going to get. The less time you're gonna need to read a book in English. And uh, the easier, you, uh, like the, the more familiarized you will be with learning in a foreign language, right? So it's just, it might be minimal, but the, the result will be there, right? And uh, the more you do it, the more these results are gonna be showable and noticeable. Yeah. Uh, this is the most important tip, guys. Cheat, okay? Cheat. Uh, there are plenty of sources to help you out. I guess if you're learning Swahili, you're, you, you're in, into a bad situation because I don't think there's a lot of things uh, online, free courses, available apps to teach you Swahili. But to, to teach you English and to help you with English, there is so much, so much stuff, right? So one of the things that I warmly advise you to do it's to use annotated editions. So this is an edition of the Turn of the Screw that I'll, I'll send to you guys. Um, it's a Webster thesaurus edition. So you can see that the text is here and you have some words are highlighted, okay? And then you have here at the bottom, the, the explanation of what are those words. So uh, synonyms, antonyms, okay? So you will be reading the original text, but you have someone to help you out. You don't have to go to the dictionary on yourself. And this is quite tiresome, okay? This, it's, it's tiring to, to read and then go to, to the bottom of the page and come back in, but, but it's much more manageable. Then you can read that, my fortitude mounted afresh, and you can realize that what he's saying is, my courage grew once again, right? So fortitude to say courage, You're like what? But that's the idea. Afresh, we can understand, but then you get, oh, okay, it's once again, yeah. So um, you can have the flavor of the original and at the same time get some help, okay? So use annotated editions. If you don't have any available, one possibility is to use bilingual texts, okay? So there are many uh, books in, in which you have like English on the left, Portuguese on the right. So I would do this a lot in German. I would read a paragraph, in German to see if I understood it. And then I would read it in, in, in Portuguese or in English on the other side. 
to confirm if I got it right. Okay, so that's a possibility as well. If you don't have a bilingual position, buy two books. Okay, so um, uh, we have here Kafka in German, and then we also have Kafka in Portuguese. So I get the two books, one in each hand, and then I read one piece on the left, and then I read one piece on the right. So you, if you don't have one bilingual edition, you can get the original and play around. Okay, you can use Kindle. Kindle is great because if you select the word, you can configure it to the, 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 the Kindle itself will offer you a translation and, uh, and oh, we have a, a pool. Uh, it's for the students, uh, not for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you guys can vote, okay? Uh, so you can use Kindle, Kindle can help with that. And you can also use Google Translate because sometimes the problem is not only vocabulary. Sometimes you know the word, but you don't really get what the sentence means, right? So you can you can try that. Google Translate helps us a lot in this in these uh, cases. Okay. Uh, another tip is, uh, and and it has already happened. One one when I mean that you should cheat is perhaps the book is too difficult to you. If that's the case, and you feel like, man, I don't understand anything, uh, I will read this one in Portuguese, for example. I'm fine with it, okay? What I want, what we expect from you guys is self-assessment, right? So persistence, but, but also self-assessment. It has already happened once that one of our students told me, uh, I could not, I could not, I tried a lot, I could not, I read it in Portuguese. And I was like, yeah, sure, that, that's great. Uh, and then she reread it, in English, though, and then she could understand much, much better. Okay, so uh, you can cheat as much as you want. Uh, number five, work on what you need rather than what you feel like it. So uh, um, I know that sometimes, um, especially when we, when we want to to study uh, by ourselves, um, there are many techniques that can help us. For example, spacious repetition, which is when you uh, create a list of words that you want to memorize and then you pray, practice uh, every day or every other day. This is a possibility to create your own flashcards if you are if you want to put so much effort into it. I think it's great. Uh, I, I do not do it that much and I should, but, uh, but I'm lazy. Uh, and I even know a guy that, that used to copy by hand and he was learning ancient Greek uh, and he was copying the dialogues by Plato by hand. I think he's insane, okay? <laughs> but but he told me it really, really works. And I know Anna has also did, done this uh, a little bit, um, copying it by hand at some point. And it, so, not so Plato, it's, right? It's, <laughs> not <wow>. Plato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but the technique, let's say. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and sometimes our students take classes on the side, right? So they are uh, going to English classes and they come to Book a Month as a way to to complement their studies. And that's also very, very great. We, we highly recommend that as well, okay? Uh, we're almost done. Uh, one possibility is to read more than once. We, we definitely um, uh, welcome a second reading. It's, it, you, you absorb so much more. So you should consider doing it if you have the time, if you have the will. You can try active reading, like dynamic reading, just like, passing your eyes in the page to, to be very, very fast. That's a possibility. Or you can read the book and then listen after to the audiobook. Very interesting possibility as well. Anything that will help you digest a little bit better, okay? Uh, and the same thing happens with our discussions. We'll be discussing the book. You will realize that during the debate with your colleagues, you will realize many interpretations that you had not thought about it. and so information will settle down and your your learning will increase considerably okay so discussion is an important part of the of the thing uh i love audiobooks as i told you guys and one of the reasons uh, for which i i, I really uh, value them is that they bring they're a different beast, right? They're totally different from reading with your eyes. And one of the advantages is that they, the book comes alive 
with intonation, different accents, right? So perhaps one of the character comes from Texas and, and then the, 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 the actor will like read like in, with a Texan accent. Or, so I, I love this. Uh, sometimes they use special effects like a door opens in the narrative and then you listen to the sound. So this really helps, okay? Uh, it keeps you focused and it saves you a lot of time. So consider doing it. If you have never tried it, try it. Perhaps you're not the type of person that loves audiobook. No problem, okay? And, and they are all available for most of the books we'll be discussing. They're available in, in audio, for example. Those are available, uh, Henry James or Edgar Allan Poe. They're available in YouTube for free. Okay, this, this channel is amazing, Horror Babble. It's amazing, the recordings are great. Um, and number nine, this one is, is very important as well, enjoying the challenge, okay? Reading in a foreign language requires an active effort. It's not so easy as doing it in Portuguese. And rather than looking at it as a sacrifice, as a, you could look at it as a game, like it's, it's a little bit more difficult, but it can be exciting. It can be a challenge. It can, it means that you are growing, right? So uh, try to see the pleasure side of it. And uh, sometimes you'll get sleepy, <laughs> but, but let's try to get some coffee, sleep more. It's good for your health uh, and, and also for your reading, right? And above all, at the end of the day, keep calm and just read on. You, you'll get through with it, okay? Talk with us. Um, I'm sorry, guys. We, we, got the, the, the whole time of the class for us. So we wanted to ask you guys, how is your, um, what are your reading habits? But we'll do this in our first class because today we, we're just so talkative. Yeah. But maybe if, if you our, have our time, maybe if you have time, we could ask like, what are you reading at the moment? Besides what you have to read for a book month. <laughs> are you reading anything special? Uh, I have the same edition. I just, <laughs> I'm reading Tolstoy. Tolstoy, cool. What are you uh, reading by Tolstoy? Uh, I just finished uh, Two Hussards. It's a novel. Mm -hmm. Never read And also uh, Felicidade Conjugal. Cool. Just uh, short stories. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. I love Tolstoy. Big, big fan. Me too. Um, Gabi is reading Persuasion, I think Chris as well. Kelly yes, is reading. I was, uh, I was supposed to, to, to finish a, a book that is not my style, but it's so well written that caught my attention. It is the Jaws from the, the Steven Spielberg ah, yeah, yeah. movie. Cool. Yes, and uh, the author. Uh, I never heard of him, but he wrote for, I think he was a ghost writer of an ex-president of the United States. So his style was really good, mm -hmm. but, but now it's on hold because I'm focusing on persuasion. Okay, good. Yeah. I always wanted to read Joss uh, because I- It's very uh, well written. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I actually heard good things about it, right? And, oh, really? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the movie is like, well, I remember the movie to be nice. I'm not sure if I would uh, find it nice as well now, but I think mm -hmm. it was. I, yeah, I really can't tell you because I, I watched the movie more than 30 years ago, so I don't remember <laughs> the details. Yes, but, right. but the, the, the book is a surprise. It's a good surprise. Cool, cool. Very nice. Uh, so Kelly is reading The Passionate, the passionate Programmer. I haven't heard about this one. Let me Google it to, to learn more about it. Is it fiction or, or non-fiction? How, how do you say novella in English? Because it's not a short story. Yeah, very good. Uh, very good question, Paul. So usually a novel is what we call a romance, right? So yes. it's longer. Uh, novella is, is a novella in the sense that it's, it's longer than a short story and shorter than a novel, right? Novella yes. with double L. And yes. then you have short story for contos, right? For both. Okay, I got it. Yeah, so short stories, novella, and novel. Yeah, so short stories uh, about, I don't know, like 10 pages, 15 pages, a novella, perhaps 60, 70, 80 pages, and a novel, everything Tolstoy writes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you.
And Michelle was reading Women Who Run With The Wolves. Ah, okay, this one I recognize oh, by the, the title in Portuguese. Thais is reading Joseph Conrad. Wow, it's a favorite. Cool, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Thai food. I've, I've never tried this one. Me neither. I read uh, Out of Darkness only. Yeah, Lord Jim. Do you usually go for, I know that Gabi doesn't go much for love stories, right? But do you usually search for love stories or do you prefer other kinds of books? Like scary ones, uh, non-fiction ones. I am, I really was agreeing, cool. What do you like? Do I like, like horror. Stories? Horror? <laughs> cool. <laughs> I, I, I was like... not very much into the genre, but but the students asked for it, and then I, I started developing. I started liking it. Yeah, me too, me too. Usually, I am. am I was such a a wimp when it came to uh, horror movies, right? I never enjoyed them. Even when my my friends were like in this time of uh, teenage years, where uh, the the greatest thing was like going to the cinema to watch the Blair, which. Pro project right uh i i went but i was forced because i never really enjoyed it but at the moment i'm enjoying it so much and i think it all started with shirley jackson because the haunting of hill house it's so nice so poetic and it does have like such a refined way of presenting horror that i i really enjoyed it so um it also with the ones uh, some of the stories that we read this semester in short stories uh, Yokogawa and uh, a few other by um, that present like horror stories. It's very nice. <laughs> okay. All right, people. And, uh, super cool. And okay, cool. Glad that we, we had at least a little bit of discussion, but we'll get back to this in our first real uh, class. And, and we promise usually uh, two things at the bottom line, right? So at the end of the day, what you should expect from, from our uh, path together is lots of learning but also lots of fun okay we try to keep it easy going funny we love jokes okay we take jokes very seriously <laughs> okay so thank you guys thank That's you right, now you know thank you i love it thank you very much people for the ones who are here for the ones who are watching it later in recording People, if you have any questions that have not been answered, we are, of course, all ears. And if you, by any chance, like after the session, you have another question that has just like come up, please send us a message and we, we can answer them for you, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. You too, you too guys. See thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Bye. -bye.